Um, hi, Rick. Thanks for helping with my project. Uh, could you say a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure, Nathan. Um, it's great to be here, and uh, you're doing some really cool stuff, so uh, th thanks for the invite. Uh, I am uh, with the uh, Assistant Director for Science and Exploration at NASA Headquarters and the Science Mission Director. Uh, basically, we're um, in charge of figuring out what we need to know at Mars to enable humans to go out there. And so, among other things, we're spearheading an, an effort to uh, buy four, no, five space agencies ac uh, across this planet to send a mission out to Mars to, uh, with a new radar to actually look uh, for where the ice sheets are there. Um, and, and that's one example of the types of things that we're doing out there to make sure we have all the information in hand so that when we send humans, we can do it safely. And it's cool, I might add, that you're very focused on the moon because there's a lot of things we can do out there to actually enable or help accelerate, let me say it that way, space flight uh, to Mars. So uh, thanks again. And uh, I guess, you know, with the Perseverance rover, the uh, MOXIE experiment is uh, probably a, a huge milestone. It's a massive milestone. It's the first time we've actually produced resources on another body, um, which is really cool. It's just a demonstration, but it's been tremendously successful. And I, I love this because um, to go to Mar send p uh, people to Mars, it takes, um, it's every uh, pound of stuff you send is incredibly expensive to get there. So if you can, um, it's not, uh, most people don't realize it, or I didn't realize it for the longest kind of time, but the real reason you need oxygen and water is to make uh, a propellant out at Mars. And that saves thousands and thousands of, of kilograms of stuff you have to send out there and really helps reduce the cost. So MOXIE is the first time we've really tried to do it and done it, did it successfully. Now they're, they're not doing thousands of kilograms of oxygen, but the proof is, has been, has been established. And now we got to kind of figure out what the next steps are from there. And then ultimately, we, uh, the Mars, a uh, little unlike the moon, actually has enormous ice sheets on it. Uh, essentially, it had oceans, and these are largely the remnants of oceans and glaciers. It's relatively pure ice, and that's exciting, too, um, because you can actually get that hydrogen, which allows you to make methane. And so with methane and oxygen, that's your ticket home. Um, and it really helps make uh, Martian exploration by humans really possible. Yeah, um, I mean, so oxygen is really key. Water is really key. Uh, you know, I, I've heard several projects talked about uh, actually producing liquid methane uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, to fuel the rocket uh, to come back. I, yeah. I was wondering, do you all have anything in the works to actually prove that out, if it's possible, you know, oh. how practical? Yes. Absolutely. So first of all, you got to get to it. Um, and so uh, a couple of things we have been, the, the good news is that in Antarctica, um, what they have done, they've actually leading the way and showing us how to do it and we're partnering with them. And so for example, when they need lots of water, what they do is they drill down um, through uh, and to essentially uh, put a heat source down into pure ice. That's called a rod well um, uh, extraction. And then they heat it and they essentially create a bubble of liquid water and then they pull it up. And when they need lots of um, water, that's how they do it. We envision the same thing for Mars. Um, now the tricky part is you have, you're basically clueless about what you're drilling through. And with drilling at Mars has really been challenging. It'll be challenging on any extraterrestrial body where you can't do the normal things that you would do in terms of ground truthing things. Um, but We've been doing, uh, making significant headway and then really looking at how you actually uh, put that heat source down there and then and bring the water up. It looks very, very promising based off what we've learned in Antarctica. This area is kind of new. And in fact, this weekend, I'm going down to Langley, Virginia, where we actually have uh, uh, university teams that, have, that, uh, that are in a competition to dr uh, drill through an unknown Martian surface or dirt layer, if you will, and then into the ice and then they have to bring it up. And unlike a lot of competitions, um, we've actually been using this to help tease out the idea space for what you have to do at Mars. And we, we have some of the foremost people who've been uh, thinking about this problem actually at this competition. <laughs> and, and it's kind of cool because these university kids are actually able to help contribute to the idea space, which is which is fun because that's just also new. They really can contribute. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I feel like, um... 
we waste so much intellectual capital just having it sit inside our classroom, um, told to sit still and put the right marks on paper. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when it's well, dying to be used for some greater purpose. So, so let's build on that thought for a moment because I love that idea. Um, uh, you know, Steve Jobs uh, did not have a college degree when he uh, founded Apple Computer, right? Um, and what what's interesting about that is that the uh, compute, per, per, personal computers and the internet were so new that there was a lot of knowledge that was superficial, not real deep, but it wasn't it wasn't real deep. And so somebody could actually get into the business and and make really significant contributions because they had enthusiasm. They had a drive to learn. They were willing to, to deal with fluidity. Um, and I think it's a lot like that in these really new areas, whether um, the Internet you know, 35 years ago. Uh, Mars today. Mars is like that. There's just so much we don't know that um, uh, you really, there's an opportunity for students, you know, that intellectual capital you talk about to actually get in there. And they're bringing different perspectives too. Um, so for example, you know, they are more multinational. Anything going out to Mars is a multinational effort. Um, uh, they also have a computer savvy that you know the um, people who came up when I came up had, don't have, right? And so they bring that sort of uh, a set of perspectives that is really important to making sure that we have really good answers. You know, 20 years from now, when we've got you know crews going out there, there's going to be so much knowledge, and it's going to take a master's degree or whatever to do it. Um, they're not to say that a master's degree isn't helpful, but really the opportunity to contribute is pretty substantial. Yeah, I keep thinking, uh, you know, there might not be much. Um, uh, it may be too difficult to worry about the transportation aspects, you know, because of high infrastructure costs. Already you have highly developed and sophisticated systems. But on the life sciences side, you know, the actual how you will live on Mars, I keep thinking if it's possible to truly um, uh, colonize the solar system, if you will, by creating mm -hmm. kind of like packaging up your whole life and putting it into a container <laughs> place, uh -huh. then, you know, really, um, it should be somewhat trivial, you know, in order of that to actually produce all the food and water and energy you need on a regular, like, suburban uh, house lot. So I, I keep, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm living in my laboratory right here. I should uh, <laughs> have some way to, you know, optimize, you know, the systems in this house so yeah. that they all regenerative and self-maintaining and yeah. producing what I need. Um, so it's an interesting thing. You know, I, I love this statistic. It's, and it's approximately right. Um, so human beings, so if you have three human beings in space for th one day, we call that three human days. And the, our total experience in zero gravity is now approaching 65,000, if not 70,000 human days in space. Human beings have a tremendous experience in zero gravity. Um, living on the surface of another planet is, is, if you've never been there, which is the case with Mars, will be dangerous at first, but eventually we'll learn to do that. But, you know, what we need to learn right now is exactly the kind of things you're talking about, which is, you know, how do you keep the body, you know, our bones were, and muscles were designed to be in a gravity field. When you're in zero gravity, you know, you're, you, they just start atrophying. And so we have exercise protocols, there's issues with vision. Um, and, and uh, you know, we're learning, unfortunately, in the space station and then out to the moon, you know, we're going to get a lot of experience, you know, doing this very efficiently. I, and then on the trips to Mars, the, the trash is a resource. You know, it is actually a resource on this planet, but we're lazy. You know, we've gotten kind of lazy and, and, and because you get used to, you know, just flush it down the toilet or throw it out in the can. That's easy. Separating out the stuff is hard, right? Or seems hard. Um, but when you're in these kinds of missions, everything is a resource. And so our need to really make these everything recyclable um, and to treat it like it is the resource it is. So, for example, going to Mars on the space station right now, you know, if you need a part for, you know, something like something that scrubs the carbon dioxide and makes oxygen, you have to send that up, you know, and. And you got to wait for a supply ship that's going up there. And we don't even have any supply ships out to Mars. All they probably we can do is pre-position stuff out there so that when the crew gets there, they can do it. Um, but 
the idea of 3D printing and really building what you need when you need it is critical. And if you do this right, the plastics or whatever you're using that you know to, for food containers just become a feedstock for doing that. And I actually think that you know we could learn to do that in our homes here. Um, we don't really have a kick in the pants that we should have, right? Um, but when you go to Mars, you, you, you know, you're going to have a kick in the pants because if you don't do it, you're probably going to be dead. And so, um, you know, uh, that more immediacy actually forces us to really think about ways of doing this. And I am convinced that it will actually allow us to view our homes and our office spaces in a completely different way um, that we might it might take us longer if we weren't getting the challenges of going out into into deep space i know i i that's one of the things i've i've been kind of exploring mentally <laughs> wish i actually had mm -hmm. something physical about it but um, <laughs> the the idea of i mean if you had like plastic that was uniform that yep. was recyclable and you had a device in your house that you could go and just take a used bottle and put it in or yeah. you know, an old container and put it in and have it actually produce something that was useful to you. Exactly. And then whenever that, you know, was beyond its usefulness, you just put it in. You know, yeah. now people are looking, as they're walking down the street and they see a plastic bottle, they're going, man, I want that. That's feedstock. <laughs> No, exactly. And, you know, and same with energy, right? You know, like, you know, most people are sitting there and their roofs are just, you know, they're just getting exposed to sunlight all day long. You know, my God, that's a massive power source right there. There's no reason why homes can't be energy, you know, uh, producing instead of energy draining, you know, um, and it, but it's uh, requires a change of perspective. Um, and I actually think I would go one step further to really, uh, you need different, we get, we get stuck in paradigms about how we think about problems, right? One of the reasons I like deep space exploration is because you just can't afford to be in a paradigm. You got to really understand the underlying assumptions, you know, and then these are also really multicultural efforts, you know, and you, by working together and bringing those perspectives that you talked about earlier to bear, you start realizing that, you know, there are different ways of approaching these problems like the efficiency of a house you know, and making it uh, less invasive on the planet. Really, you start to understand the why and the how much better with these other sort of other types of efforts, I, I believe. Yeah, and even small systems. Um, yep. Like a really good at, uh, water uh, cleaning and purification. Yep. All sorts of things are possible. Uh, you know, like whenever we wash dishes at home, we leave the water running and we're washing yep. dishes. I'm like thinking, man, we're wasting so much water. But why? Why can't you have that behavior and not waste water by simply taking the water, taking out the stuff and feeding it back through the thing? Uh, so <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go one step further. I was actually a lead capsule communicator for STS-119 where we uh, put a urine processing assembly on. It's a fancy name, right? So basically it takes urine and turns it into drinkable water. <laughs> But, you know, to take that more extreme case, right, because that was a really complicated piece of equipment because there's a lot of salts and other things in, in, in our urines that you don't really easily handle, although we hand them, handle them at a Roy's treatment facility plant. But, you know, we, we can do it with those smaller machines that you're talking about, and we're learning how to do that. You know, and I, I'm glad I wasn't on console the day that the crew and the people in the Mission Control Center were drinking their toast of water from recycled water. <laughs> But, yeah. but it was perfectly safe. And actually, I wish I had been there because it would be it, it's really an important statement to say that, you know, we don't, you know, the things that we just sort of go, Bleh, you know, really can be useful and, and safe to use. And you may not use it for drinking water, but, you know, you could do your laundry in it. You know, there's a whole range of options there that we just really need to bring into the, our homes. Um, and not impact this amazing life-giving planet that we just happen to be fortunate to have. Yeah, I mean, uh, you talk about uh, drinking purified uh, water uh, that yeah. had from the body. I mean, the other thing is also eating crickets and other yeah. types of, I mean, these are things that could be grown in small uh, habitat, but, uh, you know, at least I uh, come, you know, I have a real aversion to eating crickets, but there's other yeah. things. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> That's so. 
I love that that point because let me let's just talk about one thing that I find personally fascinating. Um, so we're on the space station, you know, when food is really important, you know, when you're isolated away from your family, you know, like if we all have a stressful week, you know, that ice cream starts to look really good, right? You know, um, and on the space station, I actually was always amazed, like when the Russian supply ships would come up there, they would put fruit right on the top. So when they open the hatch, they get the smell of fresh fruit. Oh, um, wow. You know, if you want to, in the early days of the space station, we have what we call bonus packs. You know, that's basically dessert. <laughs> And we had one crew that chewed through a bunch of bonus packs without telling us, and we didn't have the way of tracking it. And then people got really frustrated and tech, ticked off because they were doing really stressful things. And for them, that was an important way of handling the stress, just like it is for all of us. And for these deep space missions, particularly out to Mars, you know, you're storing food for long periods of time in a radiation environment. And the, there's two problems. The nutrition of this actually starts to decay and the taste decays. And so we have to really think differently about food. And so, you know, I and, you know, I'm really excited to see where that creativity leads, because I think you're going to see the emergence of um, essentially artificial meats. We already are seeing this in our grocery stores, right? But you're going to want to see that. You're going to see the I idea of hydroponics on steroids. We've actually already done work on this. And it's not, it's, it, it, it's, it may be a way of closing the gap towards uh, that taste slash nutrition thing. But frankly, human beings are, you know, we're, we grew up on a planet with plants. I mean, I'm happy when I see my little cactus right, right sitting right here, right next to me. And so learning to do that, you know, where you're probably not talking cattle because that's not a particularly efficient way of, actually it's very destructive to the planet from an energy um, in versus energy out perspective. But you will start seeing some really amazing ideas where we essentially use, you know, like they did on Star Trek where they kind of create your, you know, your beef bourguignon. <laughs> You know, it'll take us a while before we're ready to do that. But but that's a way that you can start envisioning those small machines maybe in time that are actually doing that. And the trick is to figure out how you do that in a way that is, you know, you know, portable or you can go down to Home Depot and get your food maker, you know, right? And that we're a long way from that. But that's kind of where I think we need to be to really um, make our food chain supply or food supply chain really do the kinds of things it needs to do to protect the planet. Yeah, and it's really uh, kind of interesting how, um, you know, uh, how we make food today. Like, I yeah. mean, you, you prepare a field, you plant some seeds, you water the plants, uh, you wait for them to grow, you yeah. harvest that, you take it, you, you cook it, you know, like this is, this is an extremely, extremely long, uh, uncertain process and expensive. Right. <laughs> That's right. Create the few chemicals that the body yeah. needs. Yeah. Why couldn't we create those chemicals directly? Like, I mean, so, through yeah. industrial processes. So I love that question. And so what, this is one of those things that I like about frontiers really intrigued me, which is that it's, I talk, alluded to it earlier. You have to be really careful that your underlying premises or paradigms are understood, right? You know, we have a paradigm that essentially came from the caveman days that you grow food on, in dirt with seeds. <laughs> We're using the same dirt too. <laughs> same dirt. We're back. We're really stressing it. But you know, when you are and then, so when you're confronted with the space situation, then the immediate response is, "Well, we can't carry all the dirt. It weighs too much. You know, we can't do it." This well, like, well, sc screw the paradigm. Maybe we need to figure out what plants really need, and then, and then just focus on that. And so, like at the Johnson Space Center, and then now at Kennedy Space Center, and, and elsewhere, it's not just in NASA. That there's some really innovative works on, um, and, and actually in the green movement too, there's really looking at alternative ways of high density food production that we just weren't really thinking about previously. And but it's critical to understand the assumptions and why we, uh, you know, s sort of settled into those and and really push them so we can figure out a better way to do it. Like this weekend, uh, two other things I would say this weekend. I read an article about how we're overfishing, you know, the seas. Well, you know what? 
if you really need fish as a meat source, right? Well, there are ways to intensely do it in agro, 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 uh, aquaculture farms, you know, you know, that may be an option, or maybe you use plant-based you know, type, you know, production systems to make an artificial substitute that actually allows you to do that, you know, and I just have to be really careful about those paradigms. One funny one I'll share with you is that I spent many years in flight control. And if, you, if I had to capture the mindset of a flight controller, it would be in space is dangerous on the surface is safe. Okay, that's great, except they forget to add that it, on the surface of a planet that we've evolved on for billions of years that is designed to sustain and nourish and protect human life for, in so many ways that we can't even understand it. And I'm always surprised that people will go to look at a new planet like Mars and say, in space is dangerous on the surface is safe. And they are completely ignoring the fact that you're dealing with a planet that is t a thousand, if not 10,000 times harder than K2 and Mount Everest and is like actively trying to kill you <laughs> till, we, till we learn how to work in that environment successfully. And then in fact, in that case, in space is safe on the surface is dangerous, but it's understanding those underlying paradigms and then tying it back to agriculture. You know, we have to really think about what, how we're doing it and what we're doing, right? You know, and figure out what, what the better ways are to do it that are less impactful, that provide both the nutrition and the taste that we really do need, um, but there are other ways to arrive at it. Yeah. Um... I, I, those people who say that uh, in space is uh, dangerous and on the planet is uh, is um, uh, safe. I, I think they should watch uh, Star Trek a little bit more. The older original one. I yeah. realize, like, <laughs> don't, not, don't wearing red shirt, you know. Yeah, yeah. Don't wear the red shirt. That's bad news. That's why I got a black one. On. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. You know, it's 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 uh, it's again understand being careful. We understand our little rules of thumb, so that we understand wh when they apply and don't apply. You know, I'll tell you one that I love, but just another one is that you know, so interplanetary communication, right? You know, uh, that sounds freaky because of these time delays, you can't really have the kind of conversation you and I are having right here because it's there. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that if you went back 200 years ago and someone pulled out their iPhone right here that is actually running with artificial intelligence, you know, to prov provide it, they would think that was pretty freaky. And maybe you can't cheat the speed of light, but maybe you can cheat, cheat it with artificial intelligence representing two sentient beings. And you maybe that's a way of achieving an ability to talk across a, a deep space in a way that allows human beings to outreach to each other, regardless of where they are. You know, there's lots of different ways. You have to be careful about the underlying assumptions. You can't just say, well, physics says I can't do it. Then you ask, well, how do I cheat physics? <laughs> and maybe, you know, and but that's the kind of thing, that kind of perspective. And that's actually one of the reasons why I love your point about students, which in, in there is that, you know, you get caught in these mind frames, you know, that, that um, and students, you know, are questioning more sometimes. Sometimes it's kind of drives you a little nuts, but that's okay. That's how you arrive at really cool ideas. You got to have people say, well, what about this? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I mean, like all the subjects are taught in an abstract form, disconnected from any type of practical uh, use. Uh, yeah. Actually, when a real project kind of motivates the learning and that's helps right. the so. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the most hazardous thing you can say is, you know, is to not listen. And 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 then, like a lot of times in the, our my business, you know, we're trying to drive to answers, but you really have to keep the idea space open as long as possible, so that and you need as many different perspectives so you can converge it. And I call it moving into the cattle chute, you know, because it's like you got to get those ideas and then you got to hone them down to something that actually works. So whether it be, you know, in space farming, whether it be building habitats, you know, or whether it be, it be building you know, the, the, the vehicles that go between planets, so I always call those the motherships, you know, you got to really make sure you do it right so that, um, and you need all those different perspectives. Um, so million person city on Mars in 2050, um, what needs to happen to make that happen? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, I love that question. Um, I, 
it seems very aspirational right now at best, but these are the things that need to happen. You need to lower the cost of transportation down a lot. Uh, and the the emergence, even just this last weekend with the you know, SpaceX flight, you know, where they are really going after the cost of transportation and um, in a way that private companies just are like meant to do. Um, and that's really key. On these planets like Mars that are really cold, you need power. You live and die by power. Um, and so that's another area that really needs to be looked at. Um, because, and we are looking at it. So, you know, it's not going to be, solar arrays are great, and they're, um, but the problem with solar arrays is that at Mars, you can have dust storms that last for nine months. And I'm, I'm talking like nothing runs. I mean, you're, it's like, it's like the sky is opaque. So the sunlight's not getting through. Some sunlight's not that great out there to begin with. And so those are, we lost the opportunity rover because of that. Um, and so really nuclear power is, is a key and having very compact reactors that actually have a lot of applications I would contend on this planet where you're in very energy starved areas and they need it to have the same quality of life that we all take for granted in this country. Um, now there are responsibilities associated with that too, but those you know, can be arrived at, um, but you need power. You also need to reduce the travel time um, because, uh, you know, a Mars mission is about three years, you know, and so, you know, we are probably going to talk nuclear propulsion systems sooner than later so that we can reduce that down to two years. Because frankly, three years of the body being exposed to you know, galactic cosmic radiation and all those exercise issues and all just all the risks associated with being out there, you can cut it down by a third by going to a new propulsion system. That is massive. Um, Let's see what else I would say. Uh, those are probably the biggest ones you got to do to actually really uh, do it. We know how to land at Mars. Now, you know, land, the current landers, the, the Perseverance rover is about um, a metric ton. That's a thousand kilograms. Uh, the human class landers are about 25 metric tons. That's like 25 SUVs stapled together. That's not trivial. <laughs> Because the atmosphere is thick enough that you can't ignore it, but it's not really thick enough to slow you down. And so there are some really innovative things that need to be done to do it. But I think we're well on the way. There. The big thing is to reduce the cost of, of getting there and then also um, having power supply sources that are really going to help keep you warm and, and you know, allow you to produce the, the, all the fuel you need to come home. Because it takes a lot of fuel uh, power to do that, like it does on this planet. Everything we do takes power. You and I talking takes power. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting you, you talk about power. Uh, I um, had seen a calculation that, you know, if you created a sphere that had the same diameter as the Earth's orbit, and yeah. you look at the surface area of that sphere versus yeah. the cross section of the, the Earth, that the ratio between those is like one to 700 billion. I don't like that. It. Yeah. So essentially, everything that's powered, everything on Earth has yeah. only used one 700 billion of the sun's energy. I know. So, you know, we have, we have nuclear energy today. What we're missing is the ability to use it. <laughs> right. Well, and, and, and in fact, even the oil was produced from that same small yeah. you know, percentage because, it, you know, it was plants that decayed and then they were compressed and they led to oil. And so we we just again, we just sort of take it for granted that that, you know, and really the future lies out there and then learning to responsibly harness that 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 power source that we actually are using every day as you were alluding to. I mean, that's a fusion reactor. It's just a really amazing one. <laughs> and, and we got it for free. And we got it for free. That's why we're here, probably because of that thing. <laughs> so, you know, learning to deal with it is key. So, you know, um, but I, those are the biggies that I think you have to do to really do it. I, I do think that uh, as we get out there, we do need to be very attentive to how the human body performs in zero gravity. Um, we were just not designed for that, you know, that we genetically evolved. And so I personally, while we're developing lower costs and we're solving the power problem, I personally would love to see us do more runs in space where we have uh, a wide variety of, of, uh, of 
uh, statistically diverse group of crew members or people in space that so we really understand how the radiation environment affects a young woman for example you know who has ovaries that are very susceptible to that you know or more susceptible than say an older uh, person who isn't going to have children you know and so making sure we really ramp into that and understand what we're doing um, as we get in there you know we'll get that but we need to methodically be uh, 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 doing that and the other piece that I think is actually really cool, which is that uh, when people return from Earth, um, they, particularly if they've been up there for six months, it takes a little bit before they get their Earth legs back, right? Because it's, it's a gravity environment. Um, when you send them to Mars, we need to uh, be making sure that when they land, there's no welcoming committee. Like when, when someone lands on Earth, right? You know, they've got helicopters that are coming in. They, they got docks there. They're, they're helping them out of the capsule half the time. Um, and there's a lot of support. And then they fly them off to some place where it's like a resort. I'm being a little facetious, but there's a lot of care in there. Uh, but when we land them on another planet, you know what? There's not going to be any welcoming party, you know, out there. They're going to have to... Um, self-recover both in terms of physically and in terms of being able to be productive quickly. And we need to, we could be learning how to do that even with the, our crews returning to Earth now to get ahead of this so that we really understand how to do that. Uh, Rick, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a clock in front of me, so I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Uh, if you, I'm fine if you want to go a little bit more. That's fine. It's 832, so whatever works okay. for you. I uh, no, I'm I'm uh, completely free. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Have you ever gone on one of those uh, zero G flights, the Vomit Comet? Mm. No, I want to. I actually uh, have flown aerobatics and airplanes, so you get a little bit of that in doing that. Um, like you know, when you're upside down on an airplane. <laughs> um, but I have not done that, and I would love to do that because it's a it. it your the body is just we it's again those things we accept you know it's like we're just used to being in a 1g environment so we don't think about these things and then all of a sudden you go into a you know zero g or we uh, uh, nasa did, uh, used to call it the vomit comet right for good reasons <laughs> and it's you know, all of a sudden you're disoriented and some people aren't bothered by it but a lot of people are, you know, you do, they do these arcs. So when you go on the top of the arc, you get this sense. It's essentially like being in an airplane when you do, a, you know, go over. And then there's a period where you're literally floating in your straps. Right. Um, uh, so, you know, some people get very disoriented by that and, it, and, it, and particularly if it lasts for a bit. And so learning, you know, how to manage that and, and do that is, is really important. It's fun, right. You know, but it's also, uh, but it's, it's not, it's not fun for some. <laughs> well, I, I had actually gone on a zero G flight with me and my sons. Uh, a few oh, years cool. Ago. cool. 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 And, cool. Um, you know, the thing about the zero G part is, uh, I mean, you just have this complete sensation of weightlessness. You don't yeah. feel like falling or anything. And it drives me off the wall every time I read like a sci-fi book and they're like, yeah. and he felt like he was falling. It's just yeah. like, that doesn't uh, gel with my experience. But um, the, well, the there's, first... a, Nathan, there's a difference though, because you're in, you were presumably in an airplane when y'all did it, right? That's so right. you're not feeling the wind, right? If, as opposed to shoot, parachuting, where you actually, you know, hop out, you're essentially the same thing, right? Because you're in free fall, but there's wind, <laughs> a lot of noise. <laughs> Absolutely, but I'm talking about like, uh, like Project Hail Mary as an example, yeah. where, yeah. Um, you know, the author Andy, uh, where he's like talking yeah. about how, like the main character felt weightlessness, you know, and like his start, his spaceship, and it yeah. felt like falling, and you know, he had to get adjusted to it, and and it's like I, I really think if you. Andy doesn't like to fly airplanes, so <laughs> <laughs> because he mentioned that he was invited to go on location for the the filming The Martian, but he yeah, didn't yeah, fly yeah. like airplanes. But uh, anyway, uh, but I was gonna say the first three parabolas, like the first one, they try to simulate Martian gravity with the yeah. one three, one third, yeah. and the next two were like uh, lunar gravity, the one seven, yeah, yeah, yeah. and. I felt completely fine the zero G, but I felt weird during those three. Like, I bet partial gravity felt weird. 
Yeah, I, that's actually an interesting perspective. I'm glad you mentioned that because I because I can always take that if you can handle zero G and you can handle one G, then you kind of assume that the one third or one six G environments are probably are, you know a walk in the park. But I think it's more subtle. You know, like for example, on the moon, you know, when the astronauts were walking around, you know, first of all. That's really disorienting when you can jump, you know, six times higher than what you're doing. And then the suits weren't really designed for that. And they they fell all the time, right? It's amazing we didn't break a bone. <laughs> oh, no kidding. I, I yeah. Don't kid. yeah, no, I mean, look at them. There are actually some really good uh, uh, little video clips where you actually see them tumbling and falling. And I, it's pretty eye-opening. And it's just because all the cues are wrong, particularly if you're in a bulky surface suit. And, you know, we didn't know what surface suits needed to be then. You know, it's not the space suits that we use in space. It's a surface suit is a completely different ball game. And the lunar exercises really started to drive that home. Um, but, uh, you know, it's also the gravity environment's different that you're alluding to. And uh, that's a curious point. I'll, I need to think about that. So that's cool. Um, well, if it was safe and affordable, would you take a trip to space? Absolutely. Um, I, th I would love to see our planet from that perspective. Um, I would actually love to see the planet in the vast, you know, like those, the images from when the crew of uh, the Apollo missions went around the moon and you see the earth rising over the, um, the lunar surface. That is like that is transformational in terms of an understanding of how amazingly fragile and lucky we are to have this this planet. And I there's another perspective. I don't think I yeah, we're not ready to go do Mars missions, although that would be totally cool. But one of the things I really, really curious to hear what the crews say that do those transits is that there's going to be a point where the Earth is a tiny, tiny blue dot. And you have to look, know where to look in the window to find it. And our second planet is a tiny reddish dot that you have to know where to look in the window to find it. And you have a star field that is black, but amazingly lit up with, you know, billions of stars. And how a human being that actually evolved on a planet that is like a, being in a, a protective, I'll, I'll use this term womb, and it's like designed to create life. And all of a sudden to be in an environment where you're not near people you care about, you're, you, nothing is the same as anything you, you know, I, I, that perspective, it would be totally amazing. And I can't wait to hear what they, but for me personally, I would, I just like to see the earth in front of you. I'd be thrilled with that. And I think that what's happening with the SpaceX efforts and the Virgin Galactic and also um, the Blue Origin stuff, you were going to see that sooner than later, that kind of capability become possible. I mean, it's happening. I mean, we had a someone who survived cancer, you know, with a prosthetic limb go into space and, tw you know, 20 years ago, that wouldn't even been considered a possibility. And now it's a possibility that when she uh, did video cons back to kids at St. Jude's in Houston, Texas. What a inspiration to say that just because you're dealing with this issue, we all have issues, you know what? You can go as far as your as your you know heart and des desires if you just you know you keep at it. Absolutely. And you know, talking about that, um, you know, Earth is just a dot. I almost think that a preliminary thing that we need to do is send uh, like crews on, you know, a hundred um, 150 day orbits out around the earth, you know, where, you know, they're coming yeah. back, but they still get the experience of going away. And uh, yes, uh, that's probably true. I would, I would make uh, maybe another point though, too, right? Um, the good news is for Martian explorations, space station has been an amazing test bed. We don't really think of it often as like, we talk about it, but we don't really think about it. But when you've had human beings in space for over 20 years, right? And you know, you can run up one year missions, probably one and a half year missions or whatever like that. You've got, you know, that you're in processing assemblies, recycling water, or you can scrub the, the carbon dioxide that we breathe out, you know, and make oxygen out of it, you know, and you have all these capabilities. You know, I, going out to Mars is, is, let me say it this way. Uh, a lot of times people will say Mars is hard. Um, that's a euphemism for Mars is impossible. 
Um, one of the reasons I love talking with kids in college today is they don't say that. They just, they actually go, they are, they had grew up, they were born with human beings being in space. They don't view that as that much of a hurdle, you know, and I believe that with the technology that the human species has accumulated both here on the surface and in space, it, slightly next generation would allow even orbital missions potentially out there sooner than some expect, as long as you think about logistics and how you do things like 3D printing and some uh, supplies out there, you know, and, and frankly, once human beings go 220 million miles, you know what, they're going to go down to the surface. You don't go that far and not go down to the surface. Hey, that, would be, that would be so painful. I mean, that would create its own. Yeah. Uh, but, but I, okay, so I get to ask you this question. Would you go into space? You know, before I started this thing, I would tell you, absolutely. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, between um, hearing about other people's fears, which yeah. interestingly enough, you know what the most common um, reason people say they won't go of the people that say they won't go? Yeah. Do uh, you make a guess? No, I can't guess. Well, I can sort of guess, but you tell me. Claustrophobia, which is, ah. so, is, is so uh, oxymoronic, right? Yeah. And when you have like all these people in this huge, vast emptiness crammed in this little bitty capsule. So it's interesting that you say that because we've all been enduring COVID-19, particularly during the lockdowns, right? Um, and if you don't have the right people with you or if you're by yourself, it's really challenging or can be challenging. For me personally, I, my family's in Texas and I'm in D.C. Um, and I, for a while, was all by myself. And I had to really, con and I'm pretty good because I travel a lot and I, I go places, but I had to really think through. I got to have exercise in the morning, so I'm kind of not sitting around all the time and I can see other human beings even though I can't interact with them. And I had to do exercise in the evening too, just not because I needed it, because I just needed to be outside and see other people. And and so these missions, claustrophobia is an issue. We all got a dose of it with, with COVID. Um, and then getting the right people is really, really important. Like when we did, when we went from space shuttle to space station, you know, um, you know, we really had a learning curve. The Russians were like, oh yeah, you guys don't have a clue, you know, you know, and, and they were kind of right in some regards. Um, although we all ended up teaching each other a lot of things. But the point being is that, you know, you can put up with a jerk for 14 days, you know, you know, and, and so, you know, not to say we had jerks, but we had people who, you know, maybe weren't really good for long durations where you're stuck in a, in a modules with each other. Um, and so we had to kind of go through that and really find out, how, you know, what it takes in terms of having somebody who doesn't mind the claustrophobia, doesn't mind being in a multicultural environment, doesn't mind being in a high stress situation and being away from their families for long, long times and really figuring out, you know, what kind of people had to do it. And I, I'll go one step further. I think for going way out where you just, you know, you're, it's just, you know, the home planet's a tiny blue dot and the new planet is, a, you know, the second planet's a tiny red dot. You're, we may not even know that formula for that yet in terms of what they're now. And the good news, is this is nothing new. We sent Lewis and Clark were about three years. The original expeditions down to Antarctica by the time, you know, when they left and they got down, they got all their logistics and they pushed all the way down to the South Pole. You know, this is about three-ish years. Human beings have done this stuff before. <laughs> you know, we'll figure out how to do it. But, you know, but knowing this yourself and knowing and getting the right group is really key. And I, I will tell you, I would share this too. Um, I worked the original days of the space station where we had three person crews and it was challenging because it was a bilingual environment. Not everybody spoke both languages and you could have real isolation developing. And when you, uh, when we jumped to six person crews, a, a lot of that just went away. There was like enough critical mass of the human beings that they just got along in ways that, that was really eye-opening for me personally. And I think there's a little, we're learning how to do that through the, the International Space Station in ways that I think really point the way for how to, how to, how to do and avoid the kinds of problems you were talking about. I sometimes wonder uh, if you still need to mix people up a little bit, like maybe yeah. see multiple ships on a mission, then you have like crew rotations between the ships. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the orbital, no, it's a really cool idea. Um, 
the orbital mechanics don't really work for that for for Mars because once you light the thing, you're on a path and you're you're there. Um, now, having said that, you can envision that when we get more people there, kind of pushing towards your big number that you're talking about, right? Which I think would be amazing. Um, you will have uh, on the outbound leg, which is about six to eight months, right? You bet you get to Mars, you, you'll 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 meet other people on the planet or in orbit around the thing. And we've learned to do that really well in the space station too, where they hand off the, what they learn to the new people and the, the old people, you know, head back to the home planet. And that's really a, a tremendous way to not only accelerate the science and the work that you're doing, because you get a one human being who says, this is really tricky that when you turn it like this, you know, or this is something, this is really cool. So keep an eye on it because I don't really understand what it is. And when you get human to human being interactions like that, it is platinum for advancing the work and, and, and making it feel more comfortable, right? Um, and doing that. And so you will get that. I think a bigger challenge is um, human beings need space. There is a, um, you know, we, this morning before we got a chance to talk, I did my walk, I, you know, or run, you know, and I need to be outside. And when you're in these modules, you're stuck there. And there is a relationship between cubic meters and how much a human being needs. Um, and you know, if you look at a Soyuz capsule, that's like a definition of claustrophobia. If you, you know, if you if you want it, and SpaceX capsules capsules are a little or bigger, but they're not a whole lot better. And then if you're in something for you know for you know 1,100 days, which is what we're talking about for a Mars mission, you know that we got to really think about space and how we give people you know uh, their their volumes. I actually love the idea of of using inflatables to achieve more volume. You know, because the, they're they're lightweight, but you can do it, and then the crew can spend part of their time actually outfitting it on the way out. Um, and that gives you all kinds of options if you get hit by a space junk, you know, along the way. You know, and so that's I think really how we creatively create volume and create uh, a senses of community and senses of privacy, so that you have that time to do everything we need on this planet, they need there too. They're no different, they're just human beings. And so you gotta really think through those pieces to make sure that it feels as much like home as possible because then they're gonna be able to handle the stressful environment much better. Well, Rick, uh, I really appreciate your time. And it's been, I feel like you and I could probably talk forever. <laughs> oh, no, it's been wonderful. I love this too. We got to keep in touch too. So thank you for the invitation too. Yeah, if you're ever in Houston, uh, I imagine your weekends are very uh, precious time. But uh, <clears throat> uh, we have a North Houston Space Society that I, I've Oh, I would, yeah. No, I and, go to Houston all the time. We should absolutely, have, absolutely do that because I, Houston is like my second home. I live there for God knows how many years. And I, you know, when hurricane season starts, <laughs> I feel like I'm back there even when I'm not. <laughs> the floods. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would love that. So we should do that, okay? Sounds good. Well, thank you so okay. much, Rick. Uh, you and have thank a good you, David. Day. All right, take care. Bye-bye.